I call these bad arguments against religion. Bad arguments against religion? No, no. It's just you not understanding them. Let's do this. <laughs> Greetings, fellow space travelers. Bionic Dance here. Meet Greg Kokel, and he thinks that he's spotted some flaws in atheist arguments, but the truth is, he doesn't quite get what's being said to him. He said, I cannot believe in Christianity because Christianity requires a belief in the soul, which is true. <laughs> but souls don't exist because there is no scientific evidence for the soul. Now, okay, to be fair, that would be a bad argument. But most people who make an argument of this type are really saying that there is no good reason to believe in the soul because there is no scientific evidence and that people who do believe despite that lack are kind of doing it wrong. Now let me tell you why this is an odd thing for an attorney to say. Can you imagine if the attorney shows up at a trial the next day and um, presents evidence against a client, a defendant, to show that the defendant had a motive to commit the crime in question, and that's what implicates the client in this particular case. And the client's attorney, counselor, gets up, and he says in response, you know, counselor, you said that my client here has this thing you called a, what was that again, a, a motive? Do you have any scientific evidence for the existence of the motive? And this is a quite horrible argument I hear from religious people all the time. You see, they love to compare something that should be mind external, that does not require the mind to exist, with thoughts or feelings, which we obviously cannot detect short of people's behavior. They love to make that comparison, but it's a bad one. You see, somebody's motive is their reasons for doing something. It's borderline emotion, if it's not logical. A lot of motives aren't logical. But the fact is, it has no more existence than, say, happiness or sadness. It's, it requires the mind to exist. Now, a soul, which I don't believe exists, but if it did, would not require the mind to exist. It would exist regardless of our ability to perceive it, regardless of our knowledge of its existence. It might be something that we could detect in some way, but even if it isn't, it would be objective rather than subjective the way that a motive would be. And so this is a quite horrible argument. It's apples and oranges. It's comparing two things that are frankly nothing alike. So, unlike your claim that it's a bad atheist argument, this is in fact a bad argument on your part. What the attorney is doing is he's completely dismissing any consideration of Christianity because there's no scientific evidence for some of the things in Christianity. Well, yeah, that's the logical and reasonable thing to do. I mean, if you can't prove some of the things in Christianity, like, say, the existence of a soul, the existence of God, the existence of Jesus, if you have no actual scientific evidence or data to back those things up, what possible reason do we have to believe the claims of Christianity? And those are some pretty critical claims if you're going to say that Christianity is true. Yet at the same time, his entire profession trades on immaterial realities. And yet Christianity makes a large number of claims which could be verified or debunked with scientific evidence. And generally speaking, Christianity tends to lose those battles. So I say again, he's doing it right, this attorney. He's asking you for evidence and you cannot provide. Imagine that you and I were having a discussion about whether or not I saw a unicorn out in the field here at the edge of campus by the trees right around dusk. Well, here's the thing. Much like your claims about the existence of God, you have no evidence to back up the existence of this unicorn. Nothing empirical, nothing you can show to anybody else. All you have is your claim. And I have no reason to believe it for reasons you're going to illustrate in a moment. And you tell me, well, wait a minute, you know, it was dusk, right? So there wasn't that much light. Maybe you weren't really seeing clearly because 
you know, people haven't seen too many unicorns on, around these parts lately, and maybe it was a deer or something like that. And I said, no, no, I was looking very carefully, and I had my glasses on, so I, I, I very distinctly saw the unicorn. Well, that's your claim. That's your story. But what possible reason do I have to believe you? Do you have any evidence to present? I don't see any, but I would need some to change my mind. Like you said, almost nobody's ever seen a unicorn. I certainly haven't outside of fiction. And if you want me to go against all of my experience and everything that I, if not know, at least am very reasonably confident is the case, you're going to have to provide some very compelling evidence. And right now you have none. So again, why should I believe you? And somebody else comes up to us and says, what are you wasting your time talking about whether you saw a unicorn or not when unicorns don't exist? Or, more reasonably, when you haven't given anybody any evidence to suspect that they do. Right now, the only evidence we have that unicorns exist is your word. Now, can you see that if unicorns don't exist, this kind of makes the entire conversation I've been having with the other person kind of irrelevant. And this is the strategy underlying this first challenge against uh, Christianity. No, it really isn't. What this is is a demand that you back up your claims with evidence. And if you can't do that, nobody has any reason to believe you. But that's something that religion does, not just Christianity, but almost all religions insist that you believe things without hard data. And a lot of us are not willing to make that leap of faith. And this is meant to be kind of an end around all of the details. And this is why I say that you don't understand these arguments when they're presented to you. Because this is not an attempt to avoid the details, it's a demand that you provide some. But I wonder what people who say there is no truth want me to think about their statement. What do they want me to think about it? Now, I think they want me to take their claim seriously. But the minute that I start to take their claim seriously, yeah, I see, I think I understand what you're saying. Uh, I, you know what? You've convinced me. I think you're right. I think your view is true. Well, well, see, now I can't say that, can I? I can't say that their view is true. I can't say that their view is right because they've just disallowed me from making that claim. But see, the problem here is that A, you're playing some word games, and B, relativism is not what you think it is. According to Wikipedia, relativism is the concept that points of view have no absolute truth or validity, having only relative subjective value according to differences in perception and consideration. I mean, think about it. Does someone who is blind or deaf perceive the world the same way we do? No, of course they don't. So obviously their perception of reality is relative, is different from ours. It's subjective. Now, that does not mean that you cannot come to a realization that something has validity. If someone manages to convince you with logic, reason, and evidence that their point of view is, at least if not correct, very, very reasonable, very logical, then why not go with it? That's what relativism really is. If people are convinced there is no truth, or at least no truth of a religious kind, which would be the more modernist take on this, then there cannot be, even in principle, any evidence to substantiate a religious claim or religious belief. And this is why I say that you're playing word games. Because what you mean by truth and what other people mean by truth are not the same thing. To a relativist, for example, truth is subjective. It's based on our imperfect perception of the world and our similarly imperfect interpretation of that perception. For example, consider the bees. Bees can see colors on flowers that human eyes are just not equipped to detect. So when we say that it's true that a flower is a certain color, well, that doesn't actually match the facts. It's just our own subjective truth based on our perception and interpretation. So when you say that someone is claiming that God doesn't exist and thus there will be no evidence, you've actually got it backwards. What people are saying is that there is no evidence for God, thus we do not believe in him. Therefore, if somebody thinks that any religious claim is true, it must be based on faith. And here I mean the leap of variety. Well, isn't it? 
I've never seen anybody present any objective, empirical, fact-based evidence for the truth of religion. So what else does it have but faith? Frankly, I do not use the word faith anymore. Uh-huh. Like I said, word games. I talked about putting my trust in Jesus because that's a good synonym that you can use for the act of faith that Christians talk about. Yeah, well, trust comes in two forms. There's informed trust and there's blind trust. And if you want to say that you trust in Jesus, well, he had jolly well better have appeared before you in a way that your senses can perceive, in a way that's mind external. Because if he hasn't, if it's all just the workings of your head meets, then how do you know it's not just imagination? I mean, if you're believing that, surely you can see that it's a blind trust. Surely you can see that it's faith. In the same thing with belief. He's a person of belief. Well, people think that it's just a religious fantasy. Well, it's not like you've given them a reason to think otherwise. I mean, where's your evidence? Where's your facts? What possible reason do they have to believe you? I don't want to be thought of a man as a man of faith. I want to be thought of as a man of spiritual conviction. And the sad thing here is that he actually thinks there's a difference. That I have spiritual notions that I believe are true for good reasons. Well, you're not, and you don't. Because you don't have any facts or evidence to back up your position, and thus you do not believe for good reasons. And it's not that faith isn't valuable. Of course it is. It's essential. If what we mean by that is a step of trust. And without facts or evidence, it's a blind step. In other words, it's exactly the kind of faith that you want to reject. But for many people, the idea of faith and knowledge are opposites. And they are. Even informed faith is still nothing more than a guess. It's not the same as knowledge. If you have knowledge, you don't need faith because you have the facts on your side. Some people have this strange ability to believe ridiculous things and feel good about it. Exactly. But it's not my fault you don't see it. It's not my fault that you're unwilling to accept that that's what faith is and that you have it. They'd say, look, if you've got all those reasons, where's room for faith? When you have facts on your side, faith does indeed become superfluous. So here's what I want to do. I want to do a very quick little Bible study. And I want to show you that this notion is not taught in the Bible, that a different notion is taught. And the notion that is taught is that evidence is in place that gives us knowledge, in other words, justified conviction about something. And based on the evidence giving us knowledge, we then take a step of trust in light of that information. Which could, I suppose, be called informed trust if it weren't for the fact that the evidence you're going to present does not actually hold up under critical scrutiny. Yesterday I got on an airplane from Los Angeles. I had every reason to believe, based on the evidence, I had knowledge that that airplane was capable of taking me here to Dallas. Yes, because you've seen many airplanes in action. You've probably been on several. And so you have a lot of evidence direct personal evidence on which to base this notion that the airplane will get you where you're going safely. On the other hand, how many limbs have you seen magically regrown? How many times have you seen food magically generated? How many times have you seen the cripples healed, the sick healed just by a word or a touch? How often has that happened outside of your book of religious fairy tales? And if you're going to believe your book of fairy tales as evidence? <sighs> Three examples. Very quickly, you can write these down. Check them out yourself. Starts in Exodus 4. This is the Exodus. Moses before God. Burning bush. God says Moses to tell Pharaoh to let his people go. Uh-huh. The problem is you don't have any actual evidence to back up these claims, to back up that any of this stuff ever happened. Even worse, recent archaeological findings have determined that there were never Jews in Egypt during the time period of this story. The ultimate result in Exodus 14, verse 31, and when Israel saw the great power which the Lord has used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and they believed. 
Okay, let's assume for a moment that this story is true instead of false. Let's assume that God did do all these things to Pharaoh and his people, and that they did end up believing. So, why do you have a reason to believe? The only access you have to any of these miracles of God are that book that you put so much stock in. When has God ever done this sort of thing in today's world so that we might know? Because I've never seen it. Sure, people like to blame a lot of things on God, like weather and tsunamis and shit, but so what? I mean, we have no actual evidence to say that God done it, and all you have is that book. But you know what? I've never believed the Brothers Grimm was real. I never believed Harry Potter was real. And we have just as much, or just as little, evidence for the truth of those books as we do for the Bible. And some of you might be thinking, well, why are you quoting the Bible when I don't even believe in the Bible, if you're a skeptic out there? Even though you don't believe in the Bible, what you need to understand is the point that I'm making, that the Bible or the Christian view of faith is not a leap. I don't think he even understands just how ludicrous a statement that is. Frankly, I think he's trying to convince himself. You don't have to believe in these accounts. The point I'm making is what does the text teach about the nature of faith? It doesn't teach anything about the nature of faith. What it teaches is that if God wants you to know he exists, he'll give you evidence. Evidence like a burning bush or killing off the firstborn of Egypt. That kind of thing. Something you can see and perceive with your senses. Because without that, it is a leap of faith. And this is, happens all the time, not necessarily miracles. But what we do is we take the evidence that we have available to us, and there's a whole range of it, and we infer from that evidence the best explanation. What evidence? I mean, yeah, okay, we infer the best explanation from the evidence we have, but if it leads you to the conclusion that a God exists, you'd jolly well better have some really good evidence that shows that there is a God, and I've never seen any. Faith for us is not religious wishful thinking. It might be for other people, but not for the historic Christian faith. We have always been willing to step up with the reasons, with the rationale to make a difference. Except that reasons and rationale alone are not enough to prove that something is in fact the case. You need to have mind external evidence before any reasonable person will believe you. For the record, the opposite of reason is not faith. The opposite of reason is irrationality. Faith is irrational, so it's only one step removed. And so I stood up before a fairly large audience there in a the ballroom in the center of campus, and I said, I understand you think Christians are stupid. I said, well, lots of Christians are. <laughs> but a lot of non-Christians are stupid too. So I don't know what that gets you. I'm here today to show you that Christianity is not stupid. Except that it is. It really, really is. And it's that stupidity that leads to the conclusion that people who believe it are similarly stupid. Now, I want you to see something in the objection that's being raised. Notice that the objection isn't against Christianity as a worldview. It is against the person who holds the view. Except that it really, really isn't. You see, you're missing out a step, a very crucial one. The way it actually goes is... Worldview is stupid, thus, person who holds it is stupid. And the fact that you've managed to miss that makes me question your intelligence or your motives. You're stupid. Well, people who are stupid can still hold accurate beliefs about things, right? And people who are smart can get it wrong. Ah, but you have to be able to justify your beliefs. You have to be able to support them with logic, reason, and evidence. Otherwise, you're believing for no good reasons. And being able to support their beliefs is something that Christians have never actually managed, lending some credence to the notion that they're being dipshits. And here's why I found the power of a simple two-letter word. It's the word S-O when used as a question. So... So follow the logical chain, as I just pointed out. If someone is going to say that Christians are stupid, why are they being singled out? What is it about being a Christian that would lead one to the conclusion that they're stupid? There's a sense in which, tactically now, you're going to agree with the challenge. And then you're going to ask, what point does the challenge make with regards to the issue? 
Frankly, the point being made is usually so blindingly obvious that it's just startling to people that you wouldn't even get it. But as I've shown, I'm happy to explain. So when somebody says, oh, you're a Christian because you were born in America. If you were born in Iraq, you would be a Muslim. Well, you're probably right. So? So it calls into question the validity of the religion and your dedication to it. After all, if you would have been born in another country and thus following another religion, you'd probably be feeling that that religion was true and Christianity wasn't. So how do we determine who, if either of you, is right? Hmm? I mean, that's what we're trying to say here when we point out that religions are highly variable among different people. Oh, Christianity is a crutch. You believe God because, in God because you're weak. Well, you know, I might respond, yeah, crippled people need crutches. <laughs> so you're saying that Christians are weak and crippled? Well, last we agree on something. Yes, Jesus is a crutch. So? So that calls into question your entire motivation for believing. You're not believing based on facts and evidence that shows you Christianity has validity. You're believing based on an emotional deficiency. And if you're not believing based on facts and evidence, that suggests there aren't facts or evidence to find, thus calling into question the validity of Christianity itself. Does this mean Jesus is false? because he serves some emotional need for me. No, it, it doesn't address that question whatsoever. And that's because it's not my job to prove Christianity false. It's your job to prove that it's true, which you've never, ever done. Well, Christians are hypocrites. Yeah, I guess some are fakers. That's true. There's some in every religion, lots in every religion, I imagine. So? so? I want to know from the person who offered the challenge what that observation has to do with the claim I just made. It has everything to do with it. If the person who's making the claim cannot be trusted because they're a hypocrite, then that calls into question the validity of the claim itself. You're a bigot. You're intolerant. Maybe. How about if I agree with you? If I agree that I'm a bigot and intolerant, can now we set that aside and then get on to talk about the thing? We are talking about the thing. You see, your bigotry is based on scripture, is based on the teachings of your religion. Your religion that is allegedly handed down by an omnibenevolent God. You see how those two things don't make sense? Thus, the basis of the bigotry argument. These are distractive nuisances, friends. No, they really aren't. They may be arguments that are a bit too layered, a bit too nuanced for you to understand, but that doesn't make them invalid, and it doesn't make them just nuisances, no matter how much you don't like them. Why do intelligent people make foolish mistakes in thinking when it comes to spiritual things? Gee, I don't know, maybe because looking reality in the face is too painful for them? Why don't you tell me why you've made such a horrible mistake? Why do intelligent people make foolish mistakes? Or another way of putting it is, why do most intelligent people reject Christianity for the same reason that most unintelligent people reject Christianity? That is, it has nothing to do with intelligence. What it has to do with is the demand of the sovereign of the universe that we bow our knee to him, beat our breast, and ask for mercy. Yeah, you keep telling yourself that, Scooter, because that way you don't ever have to face up to the fact that Christianity cannot prove itself true with facts, reason, and evidence. But most people do not want to do that, so they hide behind foolish, bad arguments in order to justify their own rejection. Yes, that's right, because it can't possibly be that your own arguments are lousy. It can't possibly be that we just don't believe the crap you're selling. No, no, we just don't want to be accountable to God. Yeah, right. Talk about bad arguments. If you remember only one thing from our talk, remember this. Many challenges sound compelling at first, but 
they collapse in the dust when you give them just a little bit of thought. Excellent advice. Now why don't you try giving just a little bit of thought to your own arguments? Until next time, fellow space travelers, this is Bionic Dance saying don't run on automatic. Instead, please think. Please take the time to rate this video. And hey, if you dig what I do, subscribe. And please visit my Sazzle store, where you'll find all kinds of Bionic Dance merchandise. Science. If you're doing it right, sometimes you'll find out you're wrong.